And let you all know when we are live. Okay, we are live. We are live now, so we may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Philip Castillo. I am an assistant professor in the Faculty of Management and Social Sciences of the University of Belize at its central campus in Belmopan. I am honored to be the moderator for this first Gian Gandhi Memorial Lecture. I want to extend a warm welcome to our featured speaker, Dr. Delal Worrell. Thank you. Ms. Shefelika Gandhi. Thank you. The Financial Secretary, Mr. Joseph Witt, and Mrs. Diana Locke, who are the local representatives of the Gandhi family. I also wish to extend a welcome to the Board of Trustees the administration, faculty, and staff of the University of Belize. Welcome is also extended especially to our students of the University of Belize. And last, but certainly not least, to all those who have zoomed in to listen to this lecture from wherever you are. We have a very tight and compact agenda, and we also want to maximize the question and answer session that our students will interact with Dr. Worrell. We don't wish to continue these proceedings with a welcome by Ms. Shefelika Gandhi. Ms. Shefelika Gandhi. Hello. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Gandhi family, um, we are here to say a few words at this memorial, at this first memorial lecture. Um, I'm Shifalika Gandhi, I'm Gyan uncle's niece, and I'm here with my daughter, Rouhani Gandhi. Uh, I just wanted to read a few words that my grandfather, uh, Gyan uncle's brother, has prepared for this event. It is indeed a privilege and an honor for me to say a few words about Gyan Gandhi, whose sacred memory we are celebrating. Gyan Gandhi's intellectual brilliance and capabilities have flown across the domain of law and economics. His checkered biography reflects his sparkling image. Having migrated to India from Pakistan during the highly unstable social and political conditions resulting from Indian independence and partition, Gyan Gandhi entered the toughest period of his life. During his post-graduation itinerary in Chandigarh, Punjab, London, and Belize, Gyan Gandhi was mostly influenced by developing art, culture, and humanities. In the post-pandemic period, I feel that for the total development of Belize, it is imperative to bring together thinkers of science, arts, and sociology, languages, and their learning and application at state level is encouraged. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I have a couple of lines to say to students at University of Belize. Um, so during this first momentous memorial lecture, I want to share with you that it is education that has helped each and every family member of ours to overcome the aftermath of war, partition, financial hardship, and displacement. And I truly believe and hope that with a good education, you also will be able to overcome the challenges posed by the current pandemic that we are living in. Uh, dear students of Belize at University of Belize, you can be anything you want to be, a poet or a programmer, an economist or a journalist, as long as you have invested your years in education. 
In this global economy, the best jobs go to those with the best education. So dear students, you have the freedom and the power to author your own fate to a great extent, to pursue your dreams and goals, and to connect and seek out faculty and mentors at the University of Belize. To end, I quote our former first lady, Michelle Obama, who is one of my role models. Uh, and she says, there is no magic to achievement and success in life. It's really about hard work, choices and persistence. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shafalika Gandhi. And thanks also to your daughter. We move on to our president, Professor Clement Sankat, to introduce our guest speaker, President Sankat. Kindly unmute your mic, President. I said, thank you, uh, Philip. Uh, and let me welcome Dr. Delisle Worrell, our very special guest this afternoon, and all our listeners who have tuned in to this first Jean Gandhi Memorial Address. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Worrell. Dr. Delisle Worrell is an international economic consultant, member of the Financial Policy Council of the Bermuda Monetary Authority, member of the Bretton Woods Committee, Washington, DC, and president of the Association for Barbados China Friendship. He was governor of the Central Bank of Barbados from 2009 to 2017. Dr. Worrell spent a decade on the staff of the International Monetary Fund, providing policy advice to countries as diverse as Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Latvia, Tanzania, the Gambia, Haiti, Papua New Guinea, among others. Dr. Worrell has had fellowships with Princeton and Yale universities, the Smithsonian Institution and Peterson Institute, both in Washington DC and the US Federal Reserve. He was general chairperson of the International Symposium on Forecasting 1997 and a member of the program committee of the International Economic Association, Moscow Congress of 1992. Dr. Worrell has several publications, including policies for stabilization and growth in very small open economies, South Pacific and Caribbean island economies, economic policies in small open economies, prospects for the Caribbean, small island econo economics. He has had another eight volumes of topics ranging from fiscal sustainability and price formation to Caribbean integration and the economies of small states. He has numerous other publications which may be found on the websites of the IMF, the Social Sciences Research Network, and at delislewarrell.com. Dr. Worrell is a career central banker. He founded the research department of the Central Bank of Barbados in 1973, and he has lectured at Carleton University, that is in Ottawa, at North, Northern Illinois University in North Carolina, University of George Washington University, all that's in the US, uh, the, the Bank of England, and the University of the West Indies. Dr. Worrell's PhD is in economics from McGill University of Montreal, Canada. So we have with us today, one of our foremost thought leaders in economic, de economic development for small island Caribbean states. And it is a great pleasure to have someone of Dr. Worrell's ilk to address us this afternoon. Welcome, Doc. Thank you very much, Clem. And a good afternoon to everyone. So as a career public servant myself, I'm honored to have been asked to offer the inaugural lecture in honor of a distinguished Belizean public servant, Gian Gandhi, who spent 36 years in the service of, of the country. 
I'm always happy to have an opportunity to study the Belizean economy because I believe Belize can play a pivotal role in the future of the Caribbean as the only English speaking Caribbean country with a population which is largely bilingual. Thanks to its geographical location and shared culture with the coastal region of North and South America, the Caribbean can play a pivotal role in the future of the Americas, but only if we follow Belize's example and all become bilingual. My lecture this afternoon is going to cover, uh, I've, I've divided it in four sections. The first section will uh, examine the question of how the quality in light of life in Belize compares internationally. Then we're going to have a brief discussion of the economic policy mix that works best in small open economies like Belize. And against that background, we will then discuss the uh, economic growth in Belize over the past three decades. And I will uh, finish with a section in which I make some suggestions for the future of Belize to ensure economic prosperity. So how does the quality of life in Belize compare internationally? Uh, the best gauge that we have uh, of uh, inter for inter countries internationally of the quality of human life is the Human Development Index, which is published annually by the United Nations Development Program. And Belize is a, a relatively prosperous country by international comparison, if you, uh, by the metrics of the Human Development Index. Belize is grouped in uh, a category uh, the second highest category of the Human Development Index, uh, 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 which they label as uh, high human development. The first, the, the highest category is very high, uh, and then the second highest is uh, 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 high uh, human development. Belize is on par with the average of countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, it is also on par with the uh, with countries like itself that are in the small island developing states uh, category. That's a, a group of countries uh, which includes Belize, even though Belize is not an island, uh, which um, are normally uh, uh, evaluated together. Uh, and Belize is also close to the average of the category in which it sits, that's the high, high human development categories. Most Caribbean countries actually are in the high human development uh, index uh, category, uh, with the exception of uh, Barbados and the Bahamas, uh, who are in the topmost category, the very highest ca uh, ca category, and uh, Guyana in the medium, and Haiti, I think, in the, in the lowest category. Uh, so the, the chart on the left hand side of your screen, I hope everyone is seeing the screen, uh, Belize is number 111 in the uh, world category of uh, the Human Development Index, uh, and uh, Belize is uh, uh, in red and it is uh, uh, compared with uh, on the, if you, if you go from left to right, uh, the first uh, bar represents Norway, which is number one in the Human Development Index. Uh, the second bar uh, is Barbados, which is the uh, Caribbean country with the highest ranking in the Human Development Index. Barbados is number 58. Those are both in the very high category. And then the other uh, bars represent uh, uh, the uh, Belize, as I said, which is in the very high category. Uh, the uh, bar next to Barbados is Latin America and the Caribbean, which is the, uh, the average for all the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, which is also, uh, which are, uh, the average is also in the uh, high category. Uh, the average for all countries globally that are in the category of high human development, uh, and then the, the average for the small island 
developing states, uh, which uh, is the bar right next to Belize. Health services and education uh, contribute most to Belize's high, health, high human development score. Uh, the Human Development Index is a combination of uh, indices for health, for health the, which is the indice that is used is the life expectancy at birth, uh, uh, education, uh, the uh, years of schooling is that is the indice, and uh, the uh, gross national income uh, per capita at uh, purchasing power parity. Uh, so uh, these, this is the first two elements of the Human Development Index. And uh, Belize's life expectancy at birth is 75 years, and that matches the category average uh, for uh, high human development. Um, and as you can see, it is somewhat above uh, the um, average for the small island developing countries. So uh, Belize is in the um, high category by virtue of its better performance in terms of uh, life expectancy. And on the right hand panel of the, of the screen uh, is the years of schooling. And Barbet, uh, Belize's uh, 10 years of schooling is higher than the category average. And it is also higher uh, than Latin America and the Caribbean average and the average for small island developing states. Uh, so um, uh, the uh, third category, as I mentioned, is uh, gross domestic uh, income uh, per capita. Uh, that has be in that category, Belize is below the average uh, for the high human development category. But the purchasing power, so that's what you see on the uh, left hand panel of the screen. The purchasing power of Belize's national income per head is way below the category average. However, income is still a very important because growth in real income has com contributed very significantly to the improvement in the HDI since 1990. And that you can see on the right hand panel of the screen. So uh, between 1990 uh, and uh, 2019, which is the latest uh, um, data for the uh, Human Development uh, Index, uh, Belize's uh, uh, score has risen from just over 0 0.6, which is on the uh, right hand um, scale, uh, to something uh, close to 0 0.72. Uh, in the Human Development Index. That's indicated by uh, the blue uh, bar, um, columns. Uh, and you can see that that improvement is matched uh, by the increase in uh, gross domestic product, uh, which is the orange line. So even though uh, um, uh, the income uh, variable uh, contributes uh, relatively less uh, to the overall index than health and education, uh, it is still very important because it is the increases in income which have allowed us uh, with the level of education that is already in place uh, to raise uh, the level, the quality of uh, human development in the country. Uh, and so we must bear, we must bear that in mind. Uh, because in discussing uh, the most of the, the rest of this paper will be uh, on uh, the uh, economic aspects uh, and uh, to but we must understand that to translate economic growth uh, and economic benefits into uh, uh, pro real prosperity which affects the lives and livelihoods of all Bar Belizeans, uh, we must also uh, maintain and improve the health and educational services because of the, uh, the contribution, uh, the importance of the contribution that they make uh, to uh, the quality of life. Uh, we must also uh, um, pay attention to things which are not in the index, not because they're not important, but because uh, there is not uh, comprehensive information for all countries uh, that are reviewed in the index 
on these uh, other measures. Uh, the uh, um, one which is, is, is very important and has gained uh, um, uh, attention uh, across the world uh, in uh, most uh, recent uh, discussions is the question of inequality. Uh, and in order to ensure that economic gains are translated into improvements in the quality of life, uh, we must measure and assess the level of economic inequality in the society and ensure that we reduce inequality by making sure that economic gains are shared fairly throughout the society. We must also identify and eliminate absolute poverty and take effective measures to provide basic essential quality of life for all uh, members of the population. And uh, government's uh, role is critically, critically important uh, as well. Government, we must provide effective government regulations, incentives, subsidies, and other support for sustainable economic development. Economic development must be sustainable. And we must monitor their implementation and adjust to ensure that, object, that the objectives of sustainable development are met over time. So let me say a little bit about the economic policy mix that works best in small open economies like Belize. And the focus uh, should be on external competitiveness and a balance of inflows and outflows of foreign exchange. Small open economies are like uh, little engines that run on foreign exchange. Uh, uh, um, make it, maintaining competitiveness and in a stable environment uh, uh, is a key to unlocking Bar Belize's economic growth potential. A small modern economies grow by producing goods and services that they can sell anywhere in the world at prices that are remunerative to the producers. Because of size limitations, Small uh, economies have the capacity to produce only a limited number of competitive economic uh, uh, products. That is really not a problem because these economies may sell as much as they can produce of the products in which they are competitive. With the foreign exchange that they earn from international sales, they can then buy the vast array of products and services needed to sustain modern lifestyles, very few of which can be produced locally at affordable prices. That is why the key to growth is internationally competitive domestic production. Investment drives growth uh, in Belize and in other small uh, open economies. And there is always adequate finance for sound commercial projects. There is no limit to the international demand for Belizean products, products of any country that is as small as Belize, for Belizean products and services that offer value for money to foreign consumers. That is what we mean by being competitive. Equally, there is never a shortage of finance for investments which are clearly profitable and which are undertaken by companies with strong balance sheets. It doesn't matter whether such investment is initiated by local or foreign enterprise. It will attract needed funds, if not from domestic or uh, it will be from foreign financial institutions or from local or foreign investors, business partners, or associates. Government has a role to play. Govern and it is a vital role in providing funding and incentives for social and economic infrastructure 
which may not offer a market return. So anything that uh, is profitable uh, in terms of ability to sell it on the international market will that will take the, the funding for for those activities if they are undertaken by uh, 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 companies with a good track record they never have a problem but you do have a problem with investments in infrastructure health education public order and other public services that may not offer opportunities for private investors to make a competitive rate of return. These are nevertheless very de de uh, desirable investments that impact the country's economic competitiveness. That's the, where ro government's role come in. Government must use its revenue expenditure and financing policies uh, to promote growth strategy through providing the investment incentives, through providing infrastructure, and through providing public services uh, that because of their very nature uh, do not attract private investment because they do not provide a market rate of return. It is important to stress that investment is not limited by domestic saving. And uh, policies to increase domestic saving actually do not affect investment in the open economy. If the enterprise is well established and competitive, which is to say that the producers pay good wages and make decent profit with prices which attract international customers, it will invariably attract all the funding it needs. That's the point we just made. Most of that funding will be in foreign currency before, because foreign currency is what is needed to procure fuels, construction materials, equipment, and supplies for investment projects. Funding provided from domestic savings can be used only for wages and other local investment expenses. For everything in excess of local costs, Domestic savers, you have domestic currency, they must first buy foreign exchange. Foreign finance can be used to pay wages if local finance is insufficient, but local currency cannot be used to purchase imported uh, inputs. Government policies uh, do affect competitiveness and investment. Policies to reduce economic uncertainty, uh, they, these policies include policies to reduce economic uncertainty and uh, provide, promote investor uh, confidence. A stable exchange rate, adequate foreign exchange reserves, interest rates that are in line with international trends, modest fiscal current account surpluses, and borrowing directed to physical and social infrastructure. Policies to ensure social stability, the rule of law, personal and physical security, and other factors also affect the investment climate. Policies are needed to support innovation and improved quality of products and services, as well as to support promising new activities which are already emerging. Policies of support and subsidy for small and medium enterprises are also needed. Let me say a little on each of those uh, of these uh, points. So, first of all, uh, policies uh, to, to uh, reduce investment in uncertainty. A stable exchange rate is essential. Because the economy depends on buying and selling abroad, anything that affects the US dollar purchasing power of income creates an avoidable risk. The peg is affected by the demand and supply of foreign exchange. The supply is provided by foreign earnings from tourism, exports, inv uh, foreign investment, and foreign borrowing. To adjust the demand, government must tailor its own spending and borrowing, since the demand from businesses and households cannot be effectively restrained. We, uh, historically, we have tried things like 
uh, foreign exchange controls and so on, uh, and they are uh, they never are effective. An effective framework of cooperation between the Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank of Belize would facilitate the management of public finances to maintain the balance of supply and demand for foreign exchange and ensure an adequate but not excessive reserve of foreign exchange is held at the Central Bank. Policies to stimulate quality, innovation, and small business. Maintaining competitiveness requires continuous innovation and improvements in quality and scope, such as the further development of Belize's heritage to tourism potential. The market retain, returns to innovation are often well below their potential rewards in the longer term. In such cases, government incentives, financial, fin financing, and other support are essential. A second area is renewable energy. Renewable energy and other environmentally sustainable investments are of considerable benefit uh, potential uh, to uh, the long-term uh, sustainability of uh, economic uh, development and uh, the quality of life. Uh, but uh, government assistance is essential for uh, much the same reasons as I just mentioned. Small and e medium enterprises play a vital role in distributing the gains from economic growth throughout the population. However, the mortality rate of such enterprises is high and there is an ongoing need to stimulate new businesses uh, in that sector. In all these areas, government's policy should be to identify promising entrepreneurs and all assistance given should be condition, conditional on the achievement of agreed production targets. The financing of government expenditures matters for competitiveness and investment. How the deficit is financed may affect the foreign reserves and the stability of the exchange rate. Government borrowing causes a fall in foreign reserves when government needs more financing than private lenders at home and abroad are willing to provide. If government is able to fully finance public investment with a combination of domestic and foreign borrowing from official institutions and by the issue of domestic and foreign currency bonds, financiers will be happy to buy bonds at competitive interest rates that remain affordable thanks to, to affordable to the, to the uh, borrower that is, thanks to favorable credit ratings. Uh, I need to make an a, a, a side on debt and debt restructuring. Uh, first to uh, uh, make the point that the level of the debt, of debt and its ratio to GDP tells you nothing about the sustainability of government finances. The best indicator of fiscal sustainability is the level of foreign exchange reserves. The second point I want to make about uh, debt is that debt restructuring is a last resort. It should be avoided if at all possible because it does permanent harm to the country's credit worthiness and increases the cost of borrowing, uh, of subsequent borrowing for government and for businesses that are domiciled in the country. The restructuring of debt, it also has to be, made, uh, to be emphasized, is not an alternative to making difficult choices about government spending, about the efficiency of public services, and about the priorities for government spending. Fundamental changes of this kind should accompany the, restre the rescheduling to ensure that the circumstances which occasioned restructuring in the first place are avoided in the future. And finally, as, in, as with respect to debt, as in all negotiation, the best outcome of uh, debt restructurings is one that is considered at the end of the day, the best that can be done by, under the circumstances by all participating parties. 
So let me return to the, to the, to the, to the narrative uh, to talk a little bit about government policies for equity and efficiency. Uh, the graduated income tax, uh, which has uh, largely fallen out of favor uh, in favor of indirect taxes uh, in recent times, but the graduated income tax is government's most powerful tool in moderating the level of eco economic inequity, if carefully used. We should always bear that in mind. With respect to efficiency, uh, my suggestion is that government and its agencies should publish annual reports in timely fashion with meaningful statistics on performance and finances as a means of improving efficiency. Belize, like the rest of the Caribbean, scores poorly on available international measures of public sector performance. This inefficiency of government hurts international competitiveness and diminishes the quality of life in Belize through uh, substandard public services. Uh, my third uh, section is on economic growth in Belize over the past three decades. Uh, in this se section, you can see that uh, by and large, economic, by Belize's economic performance since 1990, was above the Caribbean average. Belize is the blue bars and the moving average of uh, growth rates in Belize is the blue dotted line and the Caribbean is the orange. Belize's growth rate was consistently above the average on occasion above 10% uh, per annum, uh, certainly in the early 1990s. And it was usually uh, over the period over 2% per annum. Uh, in addition, uh, Belize avoided a slump in output in the wake of the first Gulf War in the years uh, immediately after 1990-91 Gulf War. And it also avoided a slump uh, during the global recession of 2008-2009. Uh, most recent, recently, uh, economic performance in Belize and throughout the region uh, has declined since uh, two, uh, 2015 or thereabouts. Uh, and again, Belize has on average not been as hard hit as the rest of the Caribbean. Tourism and agriculture, sorry, yeah, and agriculture, uh, agricultural exports are the main drivers of growth in Belize. And you can see that from the pie chart uh, on the uh, left-hand side of your screen. Tourism provided half the country's foreign uh, currency earnings in 2018 uh, and exports of many agricultural goods uh, accounted for another 36 percent. The other significant source of foreign earnings in Belize is migrants remittances with 10 percent of foreign uh, current foreign income. <clears throat> Of uh, exports, uh, sugar um, was the most significant item with 9% of uh, total foreign exchange earnings and fruit juices and bananas uh, in 2018 uh, contributed 5% uh, of total foreign exchange earnings uh, respectively. All the other items were um, even um, a smaller percentages. Both tourism and exports are competitive with uh, other Caribbean uh, countries. So uh, here again, the uh, blue line is Belize uh, and the orange line is uh, the average for the, or the total for the rest of the Caribbean uh, <clears throat> uh, um, with uh, the Belize uh, um, output, all, 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 is, all the outputs are measured in US uh, millions of US dollars. Belize is the right-hand scale. Uh, Caribbean is the left-hand scale. Uh, I put them close together so that you can see. Sorry, Dr. Warrell. I'm sorry. Hey. Um, the slides are not corresponding to what you're seeing. Oh, so you're not seeing a slide marked uh, both tourism and with a title saying both tourism and uh, exports are competitive mm -hmm. with other Caribbean No, we're at Belize economic growth. Oh. Oh, 
So you were seeing the slides up until that point? That is correct. So this is what you're seeing, economic growth in Belize over the past three decades. Correct. Okay. Uh, are you still seeing that slide? Hello? Yes. Yes, I'm still seeing that slide. Oh. You're still seeing it now? Still on the same slide. Okay, so we have a problem. I'm going to have to... Um, now it's moving. Yeah, so... Uh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm going to have to do this, do it this way. Uh, but let me try once again. Let me try this again. Can I share the slides with those who are interested? Um, yes, uh, but I was, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, you can do that, but I will have, I think, to go back to um, uh, this presentation. So let me, let me go back to um, what is uh, actually slide 21. So, um, uh, so to backtrack from, from this slide, economic growth in Belize over the past uh, three decades, uh, um, the uh, next slide I showed was uh, Belize's economic growth in the last three decades uh, to uh, show that it was above uh, the Caribbean average. Uh, with, um, as I said, the blue uh, bars and the blue line representing Belize's growth and the orange representing the Caribbean average. And Belize's growth rate was consistently above the average. Uh, um, and also the second point, Belize avoided the slump in output in the wake of the first Gulf War, which was um, experienced uh, uh, by other Caribbean countries where uh, output declined, and also uh, during the global recession when there was a second decline. Uh, and again, most recently in 2015, uh, when uh, output in the Caribbean as a whole declined, Belize actually did register some growth. And then the next point I made was that uh, tourism and agricultural exports are the main uh, drivers of growth in Belize. Uh, Tourism provided half the country's uh, foreign earnings in 2018, uh, and exports uh, accounted for uh, another 36%. Uh, the other source of uh, <coughs> foreign earnings uh, was uh, migrant remittances at 10%. Uh, then I showed that uh, sugar uh, was the most important agricultural uh, exports uh, with 9% of foreign earnings, fruit juices and bananas uh, uh, contributed 5% uh, uh, um, uh, each. Uh, um, so my next slide is the, where, is where um, I had reached, uh, showing a comparison uh, between uh, the performance of, oops, sorry about that. Okay, so you're going to manage the slide for me. Is that what you're doing, Sheena? Yes, yes. I think that is what Sheena is trying to do. So. Okay, so, right. <clears throat> okay, so both export, uh, tourism and exports remain competitive with other Caribbean countries. Except for the period 1994 to 2000, Belize tourism kept pace with the Caribbean. You can see there was a flat period between uh, the blue line on the left-hand side of your screen uh, between 1994 and 2000. But other than that, uh, Belize kept pace with uh, the Caribbean. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, for exports on the uh, right panel on the screen, uh, Belize, um, uh, 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 also kept pace with Caribbean. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, exports from the Caribbean as a whole have slumped uh, since 2015. Uh, Belize has 
also experienced a decline, but not as uh, precipitous as for the Caribbean as a whole. So Gina, you need to advance me to the next slide. There's a big surge in foreign direct investment in 2005. And I surmise that Belize was one of the handful of Caribbean countries which witnessed a surge of investment in response to new provisions for resi residency and citizenship. Next, please. Uh, in terms of the balance of payments, remember I said that uh, there are two things that we needed to, 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 to focus on. One uh, was competitiveness, which is what I discussed uh, with tourism and uh, exports. Uh, and the second one was a balance between the inflows and outflows of foreign exchange. Uh, so this is the picture for the balance of payments. The orange line is uh, the uh, current account, sorry, the overall deficit in the balance of payments, that's uh, the total of uh, um, uh, uh, receipts minus uh, the total of payments, uh, and the blue line is the current account deficit. The only overall deficit before 2015 was in 2004, uh, and that was quickly uh, corrected. Uh, there was a, a second, uh, in 2015, uh, Belize uh, experienced, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, overall deficit, which was the largest uh, since uh, 1984, uh, and it has taken longer to recover uh, from the foreign exchange losses uh, that uh, occurred uh, from 2015 to 2017, uh, and of course. Um, uh, the shock of the COVID uh, in 2019 would have been a major uh, setback. The fact that the overall balance remained healthy when there was a bulge in the current account deficit in 2000, between 2000 and 2005, reflects the surge in foreign direct investment that we just saw. Uh, and so uh, it is important to note that the issue of the current account, which is often the focus uh, in a lot of discussions, is not uh, informative in and of itself. Because if, the, if, the, if, the, if there's a large current account, but it is financed by foreign direct investment, that is a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, fiscal policy appears to have been sustainable prior to the uh, COVID, uh, to the onset of COVID. So these are, this is a, in this, uh, on the left hand side of your screen, you're seeing uh, the fiscal performance and the foreign exchange reserves uh, for fiscal years 2015-16 to 2018-19. The 2% surplus on, on the current account, which is the blue bar, uh, which has been maintained, is 2% uh, uh, is, the, the, is, is basically the rule of thumb for prudent fiscal management. Uh, uh, there appears to have been a policy uh, to reduce the large overall fiscal deficit in 2015 gradually over time. So the fiscal deficit in 2015-16 uh, was uh, uh, a little over 8% uh, of GDP. Now that is high. That is, uh, is a level of deficit uh, which uh, um, it is difficult uh, to sustain even if it is uh, for uh, building of infrastructure and so on, because uh, you know to to uh, do that much of, of, of public investment uh, is in uh, for a continuous period of time is problematic. Uh, uh, apart from the uh, challenge of the foreign borrowing, uh, but that as you can see, uh, policies have all all have obviously been taken uh, to reduce uh, that deficit over time. Uh, and the foreign uh, markets and the, and the financial markets are evidently uh, reassured uh, by uh, the fiscal policy because the foreign reserve cover, even though it has been falling, has not fallen precipitously. And that suggests that markets are reasonably confident in the appropriateness of the fiscal strategy. Next, please. So uh, uh, one last slide on the economic performance uh, uh, to discuss the impact of the COVID-19. 
this slide is based on projections of uh, uh, economic growth, uh, which uh, appeared in the IMF's World Economic Outlook uh, pr uh, uh, publication in October 2020. Uh, and uh, I have plotted for 2019, that's before COVID, for 2020, and the forecast for this year, 2021, for all the Caribbean countries. Uh, Belize is the black uh, line, a black column, uh, so that it stands out from the others. Uh, and the IMF forecast in October, 2020, that Belize's GDP in 2020 would fall by 16%. It was the fifth worst, worst impact uh, of COVID in the entire Caribbean. The worst uh, impact was on Aruba, uh, where GDP fell, uh, was uh, projected to fall uh, by uh, as much as 20%. Uh, in October, the IMF expected Belize to recover half of the loss in 2020 uh, with uh, a growth rate of 8% in uh, this year, 2021. Uh, but at the time of uh, the October forecast, uh, the, no one would have uh, known about the uh, surge in uh, COVID infections in North America and much of Europe uh, during uh, the current winter pro, uh, uh, season in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and therefore, uh, the prognosis for 2020 uh, once it is updated, uh, which will happen uh, in a two weeks, uh, two months time, is probably going to be uh, less optimistic uh, than appears on this chart. Next one, please. So now we move on to my final section, which is suggestions for policy for future economic prosperity. The immediate priority is to tame the COVID, COVID epidemic and reopen the economy to tourism. In order to, su su to suppress the virus, the World Health Organization advises comprehensive testing, tracing the contacts of persons with COVID, mask wearing and social distancing, isolation of actual and suspected COVID positives and vaccination. Tourism, as uh, we have stressed is uh, the principal source of foreign exchange uh, for Belize and the recovery of tourism depends on international agreement on protocols and procedures for airlines, ships, airports and seaports, border control uh, procedures, hotels, restaurants and places of entertainment. Caribbean governments, including the government of Belize, should take the lead in securing agreements on these matters through the relevant international bodies. What uh, countries can do individually and what the region can do of its own uh, will never be sufficient. We have to engage with the international bodies. In the longer term, Belize must strengthen its health systems against future pandemics. The international consulting firm McKinsey and Company has suggested uh, that countries should uh, put emphasis on the following items. The health systems need to be alert for the emergence of contagious diseases and ready to spring into action at a moment's notice. Health workers should be trained and equipped to detect infections from their early symptoms and there should be swift and effective systems of reporting. Vaccination facilities should be universally available. The health system should be designed to rapidly mobilize personnel, equipment, and facilities to meet a surge in infections without compromising essential health services. And Belize needs to participate with other countries in global research on infectious diseases through the Pan American Health Organization and other global networks of collaboration. So this is medium term investment that all our countries have to put uh, into strengthening our health systems. In terms of opening the path to renewed growth after we have overcome the COVID pandemic, 
government should consider a thoroughgoing reform of the delivery of public services to achieve set quantitative targets for performance. And there should be accountability through timely publication of annual reports with statistics on performance and finances. We all, all our countries need to raise public services to international standards. It is the single most important thing that we can do to increase competitiveness. And it would also serve to improve health, education and other uh, well-being indicators which would improve our standing in the Human Development Index. And fiscal incentives and support should be aligned with the competitive strengths of Belize's tourism and exports. Belize's growth will continue to be led by its attractive tourism services and competitive exports. Remittances will continue to supplement foreign inflows. Tourism and agricultural exports will continue to be the main drivers of growth. Official policy should provide incentives and support for private initiatives to enrich product offerings and add value. Remittances will continue to be an important source of foreign exchange. Migration from small economies is inevitable and desirable because of the limited range of possibilities which the small economy offers for the realization of individual talents. As the increasing worldwide flows of remittances demonstrate, migration is a source of foreign revenue for the sending country and it is simultaneously a productivity benefit to the receiving country. Renewable energy offers the possibility to improve growth rates by saving the foreign exchange now spent on fossil fuel imports. Belize could now produce, provide all the electricity it uses from renewable sources using affordable, well-established technologies such as hydro, wind, solar, and biofuels. Belize has a head start because it is already uh, generating 50% of electricity from hydro. Costa Rica is the country that leads the way, generating almost 100% of electricity from renewables. The savings could be even greater with the use of electric vehicles, of which there are now a considerable variety. Norway leads the world in electric vehicle sales, with 75% of cars sold last year being pure electric or plug-in hybrids. Sunshine, wind energy, and falling water are now more valuable natural resources than fossil fuels because they are inexhaustible and non-polluting. Realizing the potential for re renewables does require a fully articulated medium-term strategy, specifying the elements of the energy mix, setting three to five year intermediate targets for implementation, review and adjustment, and with widespread public information and engagement. To achieve Belize, Belize's prosperity in the future, renewed growth is not enough. The policy suggested should assure Belize of renewed economic growth for the medium term, provided they continue to be underpinned by a fiscal policy that maintains a current account of surplus of around 2%. The benefits of this growth will be greatly magnified if public sector reform results in higher life, life expectancy and improved schooling outcomes. The improvement of livelihoods would be even greater than the HDI will measure if an efficient graduated income tax, support for small and medium enterprises, and other measures are implemented, ensuring that the benefits of growth are widely shared. And finally, to summarize. Economic policy to put Belize on the path to future prosperity would include engaging with the international tourism industry to restart the tourism sector, a strategy for strengthening health systems as a, a national priority, reform of public services to raise performance to international standards, targeted support for maintaining and strengthening the international competitiveness 
of tourism and exports, a fully articulated strategy to achieve 100% use of renewable energy within a demanding but realistic time frame, and fiscal management characterized by borrowing to create durable public goods and fiscal policies designed to ensure that the benefits of economic growth are widely shared. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Worrell. It's now around one o'clock in Belize, and we have 20 minutes for question and answer session. We now open the floor for questions and answers from students and other stakeholders who are listening. We're asking that you keep your questions and your comments as brief as possible to facilitate many of those questions and or comments. So we are now open for questions and comments for Dr. Worrell. Angelo Azueta, I see your, your hand is raised. Can you proceed, please? You need to unmute. Hello, good afternoon. Hello. It was a pleasure hearing your presentation, Dr. Worrell. Thank you for that. I am honored to have been a member of this guild. My question for you is that in 2015, based on your presentation, there was a report that Belize experienced a financial deficit in terms of its foreign exchange amounts or its capacities. As such, I was wondering if you could kindly provide me a reasoning as to the resultant of that outcome. Right. Uh, I haven't been able to study uh, the individual years uh, in sufficient detail to be able to answer that question. Uh, so, uh, but what um, really matters is that uh, the um, uh, Belizean uh, ma economic managers were clearly on top of the situation uh, because it wasn't allowed to get out of hand. So that the, rather than seeing uh, continuous uh, uh, deficits uh, of growing magnitude, which would have uh, put uh, great pressure on the foreign exchange reserves, uh, the reserves, even though they have declined and there were subsequent deficits, uh, that decline has been moderated over time. Uh, so from a macroeconomic point of view, one can make a quick judgment uh, that whatever the source of the, of the difficulty, it was handled appropriately. Other questions? Dr. Worrell, um, how relevant would you say are Arthur Lewis's theories to contemporary beliefs? Uh, I think that um, uh, Arthur Lewis is, um, you know, uh, his contributions to economics are enduring. Uh, and I, um, I, I have to admit that I have not myself uh, recently gone back uh, to um, his uh, classic uh, uh, writings, including his theory of economic growth, uh, which I think is an underestimated classic. Uh, but, but clearly the insights uh, that um, he offered uh, um, are relevant to the current circumstances, but they have to be reinterpreted. Uh, so uh, for example, if you, if you um, go back to um, the uh, economic development with, with unlimited supplies of labor, which is which is sort of the caricature of, of his first, of his most uh, well-known uh, thesis. Uh, that was uh, a, a theory con, uh, sort of within a, a closed economy context. So uh, he was looking at uh, labor within a single country uh, that was available in the agricultural sector and that could migrate uh, into the industrial sector. Uh, and that is 
uh, a, 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 a theory uh, which the Chinese have demonstrated uh, the uh, modern relevance of that theory, because that is in fact uh, what China has done uh, over the last uh, 700, uh, sorry, so the last uh, 40 years, uh, that they have brought uh, 700 million people out of rural agriculture into industry. Uh, and they have created tremendous uh, productive capacity uh, out uh, as a result of that. And we have all benefited from that. And the Chinese are very aware of the relevance of, 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 of uh, uh, Lewis's uh, theories uh, as, a result, as a result of that experience. Uh, but for countries like ourselves, like um, Barbados and like Belize, uh, the new reality is that our labor pool is not limited to the domestic market any more than our um, uh, uh, the, 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 the market for our products is limited to the domestic market. So we are now in a world where uh, migration is an important factor. Uh, and I think that that is the thing that we have to factor into our economic calculations, which modifies uh, the uh, Lewis thesis. So that uh, in agriculture in particular, in most countries uh, in this region and in North America, uh, agricultural labor is mainly migrant labor. So that you're drawing, you're getting productivity by drawing not from a pool of labor, which is in your own country, but by drawing from other countries where uh, by migrating uh, to uh, um, more prosperous countries, uh, um, you are able, th th there is a win-win situation where the migrant earns uh, higher wages than he would earn for the same or she would earn for the same labor in their own country uh, and is able to fuel uh, an economy based on remittance flows, which is as, uh, very important uh, to many countries. I noticed that some persons are typing in their questions in the chat. I am seeing that. Your questions, um, Dr. Warren, you, you are seeing the questions being asked in the chat? I'm seeing them, yes. So um, uh, I see a question from Rebecca. Uh, uh, is it feasible for elect for the electric company to assume? Oh, right. So uh, in terms of the technology, um, uh, it is entirely feasible. Um, uh, and what I can mention in that regard. Uh, so the question is: Is it feasible for the electric company? Uh, to assist Belizean households to acquire re renewable energy in replacement of the traditional uh, grid system. So uh, um, what is happening in Barbados and what is, is, is now uh, the norm in, in many countries uh, is a system where uh, um, the uh, individual power producers are, um, there's provision for them uh, to uh, supply power to the grid. So that may be individual households, individual uh, businesses, uh, and um, uh, you know, people who have uh, the land space available to do solar or to do wind. Uh, and so the government uh, in Barbados uh, has provided the legislative framework uh, where someone like myself, for example, uh, we have a, a, a solar system on our roof uh, where we sell the uh, power to the national grid. Uh, the um, uh, uh, power company so continues to supply us with uh, our power. Uh, we sell all that we um, uh, produce to the grid the power company sell, uh, provides us with all the power we need, uh, but we have scaled our system uh, to uh, produce on average enough power to ensure that we don't have to pay any monthly uh, charge. So what we supply uh, is matches what 
uh, the power what we use uh, by and large. Um, uh, and our system was actually supplied to us by a subsidiary, which our local uh, um, grid manager, uh, the Barbados uh, Light and Power Company, they have set up, or their parent company has set up a company uh, to install renewables. Uh, so your question is, is it possible? It is entirely possible. And this is being done. Uh, I also have a question uh, from Shante, uh, uh, government identifying promising uh, entrepreneurs. Right, so um, I, I think the government's responsibility uh, is to uh, support entrepreneurs where they uh, appear. Um, governments, in my experience, are not good at identifying entrepreneurs. Uh, I think that is be better, best done uh, by uh, non-government organizations, even by the universities and so on. Uh, um, and uh, uh, supported by uh, community organizations, by credit unions, and those sorts of things. Uh, what I think government needs to do is to have government agencies uh, which uh, can provide targeted support where the entrepreneurs need it. Uh, um, uh, most um, uh, often, uh, entrepreneurs need uh, uh, seed funds to get started. Um, if you're just getting started in, with a new idea and so on, you don't want to be going to borrow money because you borrow money from the banks from the time that you borrow from a month later, you have to pay back. You don't have any customers yet. You don't have any income. Uh, so it's that kind of support that, that needs to be provided. Uh, if there, you know, there's often uh, entrepreneurs don't understand uh, the basics that they have to have in place in order to give them a reasonable chance for survival. Uh, these kinds of uh, um, technical support and so on, again, the government is not good at providing themselves, but they can fund uh, institutions which are set up to do that. Uh, most re recently, we've had the uh, emergence of peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, and other support mechanisms. Again, these are things that uh, um, the government could support uh, by providing uh, a regulatory framework uh, which protects participants uh, in these arrangements uh, from, uh, you know, um, risky practices, let me put it that way. Um, I've been asked by Sheila uh, um, a question which I don't think anybody has the answer to. <laughs> how, how long before uh, the economy will return to normality? Uh, I think that that is, um, you know, the, the uh, COVID-19 is, you know, uh, um, to use a word which is often uh, overused, unprecedented. It is something which has not been part of our experience ever before. I mean, we have had pandemic, pandemics before, but not in a world which is as interconnected uh, as is uh, the world of uh, 2021. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think that, um, you know, um, what we have got to focus on really is how do we get ahead of this pandemic? Uh, and only when we have reached that stage, and when I say we, uh, uh, it ha really has to be an international uh, uh, effort. Uh, and, uh, you know, as we all can easily observe, uh, we are doing a terrible job of it because uh, the world's richest country is actually setting such a poor example. Um, then uh, we have a question from Lonetta Price. Uh, 
So my point about uh, the health services in um, Belize is that uh, they are better than uh, the comparable countries uh, in the same high human development category. So it's uh, um, I, uh, I I hope I haven't given you the, the wrong impression by um, putting the bars in red. That was just for emphasis. <laughs> but in fact. Uh, your health services, um, uh, judging by the outcomes as far as life expectancy is concerned, uh, and as far as um, the years in schooling is concerned, and these are not perfect um, uh, indicators. I mean, uh, you can spend a lot of time in school and, and the quality uh, of your education may, may not be good. Uh, so there are a lot of quality issues and so on, which can't be captured by a global index uh, such as this. Uh, so I think that uh, I don't want to suggest that we can rest on our laurels um, because I think that it is uh, critically important uh, that we uh, continue to secure the progress that we have made uh, in health and education uh, and build on it uh, to make it more uh, robust. Um, I'm not the expert in these areas, uh, but I think that um, it, the investment uh, which we make in uh, improving those services uh, would be uh, very, um, uh, pro uh, very much um, we yield uh, rewards, as I say, both in terms of creating a more attractive climate for uh, investment of all kinds, and also uh, providing uh, um, better services uh, to assure a better quality of life for Belizeans. Uh, okay, so uh, 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 Mr. Palacio has given us uh, um, uh, the background on the 2015 fall in reserves uh, and reminded us that it is due to the settlement of the arbitration award and um, uh, that has impacted uh, the reserves, I think, for the last few years, if I'm not mistaken. So please check the uh, uh, Marion Palacio's comment on the chat. Right. Um, so on the question of the cost of uh, solar power, uh, um, th those costs are actually coming down. And they're coming down because um, of the um, uh, a, a huge production capacity which uh, China has brought onto the market. Uh, so um, uh, I, I think that, and, and the, the critical thing really is for government to provide uh, the right legislative uh, uh, um, uh, context. That's why I stress that uh, what one needs in order to uh, sustain a strategy of uh, renewable energy uh, is uh, an overall uh, a strategy uh, which government coordinates and leads, uh, which has all the elements uh, that uh, go into a mix. This is this is a this is a really major social change in how the society and the distribution of energy uh, of, of electricity is organized and it is not going to happen uh, um, on its own uh, it requires a consistent set of incentives uh, and i think that the major incentive now is no longer the cost because the costs have come down they're competitive uh, you can uh, in barbados and i'm sure because you know we get this or, 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 or all our, our panels from China, and you can get them from China too. Uh, it costs less uh, to put a panel uh, of the size that I have put, on, that we have put in our homes uh, in place than for uh, a, 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 this, a sort of a family, a small family motor car. Uh, so, and the returns are certainly, uh, you know, um, you know, not you know well in excess of what you get from uh, owning a motor car which depreciates uh okay i have um a question 
should Belize move from a free market? E right. So I, I think the, the, the argument between free market economies uh, and uh, sort of controlled economies, uh, um, it, it, even in the economics profession, I think it is beginning to be realized that this is uh, sort of a, a mis- apprehension of reality. Uh, and I would refer you to uh, work on the entrepreneurial state, so-called. Uh, the principal uh, sort of name in that field is uh, Professor Mazzucato, uh, who is with, I believe, Oxford University. Um, uh, and if you Google the entrepreneurial state, uh, you'll get a number of references. Uh, and the point that she makes is that uh, even countries, even countries that are the so considered to be the ep epitome of uh, the free market for the United, for, for example, the United States, uh, the, 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 in certain areas, areas particularly of innovation, uh, the state actually is the principal financier and supplier uh, of. Uh, uh, or for um, the market, the so-called market firms. Uh, so, if you take aviation, for example, uh, um, there are the companies that make uh, aircraft engines, for example, uh, they make most of their money from military contracts, not from civilian contracts. Uh, so, uh, the notion that uh, there are countries that um, you know, are, have market systems and countries that have uh, uh, control systems. Uh, that has uh, changed dramatically over the last uh, 60 or 70 years. Uh, so you have a country like China, which uh, people in the West can't understand uh, because it behaves like a free market uh, uh, economy, even though uh, it has a large proportion of uh, state enterprises in the mix. And even Cuba is now moving towards uh, more market liberalization uh, because of uh, the obvious benefits that competition uh, brings uh, in terms of efficiency. I have a two-part question on sovereign debt restructuring. Dr. Warren, can you answer one more question before we move on, please, sir? Just one more right. question. Uh, from the chat or from... That's from the chat. That's from the chat, okay. Okay, so this is a long question. Uh, uh, I mentioned that government should restructure it. So this is a question on debt restructuring. Okay, so uh, it relates to the um, uh, ways in which uh, or, or opportunities for um, uh, um, reorganizing uh, uh, debts, uh, such as uh, debt swaps and carbon credits and so on. Uh, my general point on this is that, um, is a point actually which um, uh, I first heard enunciated uh, by uh, Laura, Professor Lawrence Summers. And that is that the investment requirements that we have for renewable energy, for sustainable systems and so on, are vastly in excess of uh, the amounts that we now owe. And so uh, the emphasis on debt restructuring uh, is in a sense misplaced because the gains that we, or, or to put it to put it the other way, if we just uh, sort of uh, peg along and pay off our uh, debts as best as we can and focus on opportunities for new investment, the potential benefits that we can get from new investments, if we just uh, manage to the, our debts, the debts the best we can without major restructurings uh, will over a, a period of time which will probably be shorter than we realize will give us uh, benefits which will make the whole question of uh, debt restructurings fade into the background. 
I think we are already seeing uh, what is possible uh, in terms of the orders of magnitude uh, of new credits, uh, which the major industrial countries are uh, dispensing in order to cope with uh, COVID. Thank you very much, Dr. Worrell. We now move on to reflections by Belize's Financial Secretary, Mr. Joseph Waite. Mr. Joseph Waite. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first, allow me to say a quick thank you to Dr. Warren for the very informative and pertinent lecture this morning and to Professor Sankat and his UB family for organizing the event. Uh, the subject of the presentation is extremely relevant in today's very challenging world as we try to grapple with the economic fallout from the pandemic and to try to restore growth in our small economies. Secondly, I would like to say a few words about the late Mr. Gian Chan Gandhi himself and how we got here today to this lecture and we're, how we are benefiting from the thoughts and insights from an eminent Cari Caribbean scholar, uh, all in the memory of Mr. Gandhi. In my time at the Ministry of Finance, I've had the good fortune of getting to know Mr. Gandhi and to work along with him for almost 20 years when he served in the capacity as legal counsel in the Ministry of Finance. And I can truly say that I learned a great deal uh, from Mr. Gandhi and over that period of time, and I'm humbled to consider myself, maybe I'm being pres presumptuous, consider myself as being a friend uh, of, of late Mr. Gandhi. I think that the title of legal counsel does not begin to convey sensitive role and functions of Mr. Gandhi's service to the government of Belize. I think that perhaps a better title would have been Council at Large for the Government of Belize, for indeed his work extended to cover almost every aspect of the legal spectrum, giving almost flawless advice on a wide range of matters, including privatizations, nationalizations, tax matters, personnel matters, land issues, extraditions, the list goes on. His contributions to the government and people of Belize was indeed larger than life. His knowledge was encyclopedic and his commitment and dedication to his work was second to none. His life was his work and his, and his work was his life. Those who knew him, and Mr. Castillo, our moderator, I, I can confirm this, Mr. Gandhi worked from Sunday to Sunday, every day, every week of the year. Holidays were no exception. Whoever coined the term 24 seven must have been thinking of Mr. Gandhi. On the personal side, Mr. Gandhi was a very humble man and one who could, and one could say an even a shy man. He eschewed the limelight and avoided large crowds and social gatherings. But at the same time, he was not shy in advising the government, taking truth to power and telling the governments of the day like, what it is and like it is. And for the most part, they listened. I can recall one occasion when Mr. Gandhi was to host a luncheon for a visiting legal team. And I happened to be one of the invitees, basically to fill up the table. When it came time to sit for the meal, everything was in good order. Everything was in place with one notable exception. There was no Mr. Gandhi in sight. Then I got an urgent message to say that he was tied up in meetings and could not make it. And if I could kindly stand in for him as the host. I attempted to do so. Don't know if I succeeded because I could never fill his shoes. Later that evening, I went to see his secretary to ask, well, what was up? And I was gently advised that, Mr. Waite, you should know Mr. Gandhi by now. While he had no family of his own, Mr. Gandhi in many ways had a much larger adopted family, which included many of his faithful staff and a few close friends. He had the milk of, hum milk of human kindness running through his veins and he would readily provide advice and counsel to anyone who stopped by, who might have some personal issue, legal issue, and he would do so freely, taking time away from his busy work 
with absolutely not even a thought of a thank you uh, in return. Six years ago, after a career of almost 40 years in, in Belize, the good Lord called Mr. Gandhi to his reward. His family in India and the US thought it would only be fitting if a portion of Mr. Gandhi's estate would be gifted to the people of Belize, his adopted country. And after some further consideration, it was decided that a very appropriate way of doing so would be to support the academic functions of the University of Belize by establishing an endowment fund at the university and which would host in addition an annual lecture in the area of economic development for Belize. I'm very pleased to see today that there are over 265, the number went up earlier, it was almost 340 participants in the meeting today. This is the first such lecture with many more to come. I cannot think of a better way to, have, to honor Mr. Gandhi's memory and all, at the same time contribute to the economic development of Belize. So I would want to thank all, particularly Dr. Sankat, uh, Professor, um, uh, Professor, Professor Delisle Worrell again, and to the UB, UB faculty and staff for putting off what I think was an excellent lecture today. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Waits. Today's proceedings now conclude with the vote of thanks by Dean Dr. Vincent Palacio. Dean Palacio. A pleasant good afternoon to one and all. Uh, thank you to Dr. Warren for that informative uh, presentation, informative lecture. I am certain our students really grasped right about and another thought for a future conversation in our classes. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our president, Professor Sankat, for his continued vision uh, in sharing us as a university to address relevant issues. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I'd like to thank the family of uh, Mr. Gandhi for your opening remarks and for your continued support of the university. Thank you very much. And you couldn't have said it better, Mr. Wade, uh, in that remark, your closing remark, the kind of person uh, Mr. Gandhi was and how much he loved this country. Thank you for your presentation. We'd like to thank our students uh, who willingly participated. I would say some of them with a little club on the, on, on the back, you know, you have to, but most of them uh, looked forward to it and were with us. And when we were told that it is also on Facebook, uh, so we're having at least four or 500 more doing it on Facebook since they couldn't get on the Zoom. So we will not have an exact number as to who was actually present. Uh, thank you, students. Thank our host, our moderator, uh, Dr. Castillo. Uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. We now conclude this afternoon's presentation. Thanks again to all. One correction. The president would like to make a presentation to Mr. Warrell, to Dr. Warrell. Sorry. Thank you all very much. Let me say how much we at the university appreciate Dr. Worrell's time and effort to prepare and present this wonderful lecture to the university and the wider community in Belize. Thoughtful academic presentation, as well as very impacting in its application. And the least we can do, uh, Delisle, is to leave you a little token of our appreciation from our university, which we hope you can put on your mantelpiece and which speaks to uh, our thanks for the presentation you gave this afternoon in memory of G.N. Gandhi. It's the first lecture and I think it has been a great start. Thanks to your wonderful work and presentation and we wish you all the best in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, this is very much appreciated. Uh, I enjoyed uh, the, the uh, afternoon uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity, as I said at the beginning, especially so now uh, 
now that I am fully aware of all uh, the uh, circumstances. I, I I must confess that I did look up uh, uh, Mr. Gandhi uh, on the internet, as 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 as, as you know, now we are now able to do, uh, and that's why I was aware of. Uh, his length of service uh, to, to Belize, uh, but um, uh, uh, the information on his background uh, and the circumstances uh, of his coming to Belize and his endow and the endowments and so on, uh, that really has added a very special dimension to the occasion. And I really want to express my appreciation uh, for the opportunity and thanks for the gift. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Dilal. Thank you. Bye. Bye.